good effects of centering prayer are to be found not so much during the periods of prayer with their varied psychological experiences like uh, consolation and desolation, sweetness and dryness, peacefulness and uh, the bombardment of innumerable and unwanted thoughts. Rather, the good effects are manifested in the change that takes place in attitudes and behavior and in our overall experience of daily life. For example, an increase of peace, less domination by the emotion, concern for others, and a willingness to serve God and others. There are, are practices for daily life based on the Christian tradition that can help to further the spontaneous effects of centering prayer in every facet of daily life. Family relationships, workplace, play, and recreation. Sister Bernadette Teasdale, who is the coordinator in the Denver area and the director of the Center for Contemplative Living, will now present a brief sketch of the human condition. Her presentation is a synopsis of the spiritual journey, tapes 6 to 15, and will serve as a preamble to the welcoming prayer. The human condition. What is it? Well, one of the, the, uh, the first recommendation I would like to make to you is to really fully understand the human condition is to pick up Father Thomas's book on the human condition that's just been uh, published by Paulus Press. Father Thomas uh, had two lectures at Harvard Divinity School and then they put it into book form. So this is a very complete uh, rendition of what the human condition is. What I'm going to do with you right now is just give you a brief sketch so that in the context of understanding the human condition, you will better understand why we need to do the welcoming practice that Gail is going to share with you in just a little while. So for me, as I've learned the human condition from Father Thomas, one of the best ways to, for me to explain to you what it is is to tell you a story. He told us the story of the Sufi master who had lost the key to his house. So he went outside in the grass and started looking for his key. And eight or 10 of his disciples came along and said, Master, what's wrong? And he said, I've lost the key to my house. And they said, well, would you like some help? And he said, well, I'd be delighted. So all the monks got down on their hands and knees and carefully went through all these blades of grass. And after a while, the sun was getting hot and they said, uh, Master, uh, where do you think you lost your key? Um, and the, the master looked at him and said, well, I lost it in the house. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the disciples all looked aghast at him and said, why are we looking for the key out here? And the Sufi master said, well, it's obvious. There's more light out here. Now, that is really a paradigm or a parable of what the human condition is. The key to happiness is inside of us, but we've lost that key, and because that key is really finding intimacy with God, when we don't experience that, we look somewhere else. And the problem with the whole human condition is that nobody knows where to find it. So we have lots of friends with us looking for the key, but they don't even know what they're looking for. But what they've substituted for happiness and intimacy with God is security, esteem and affection, and power and control. Those are, are the basic needs that in developmentally, we come into this world 
feeling that instinctual biological need for security, for esteem and affection, and for power and control. But what happens as the child begins to grow, those needs are not perhaps promptly met or they have felt deprived, whether they were or not, that was their perception. And what happens is demand energy forms around those, those three needs, of security more and more, and to get the attention of their parents. Uh, for esteem and affection, if the child is not picked up, if it's not loved and received affection, the demand for it gets even stronger and the energy builds around it. And finally, for power and control. We need to have power and control of our lives in a reasonable way. But when though that deprivation happens to a child, as they grow, the demand for those programs that go around like little sons demanding the attention that they need. And when they are not fulfilled, these programs get stronger. And as the child begins to grow, by three or four or five years old, they begin to take on the values of their family, their peers, uh, of what they learn in their preschool. And what happens is, is that the focus of the universe becomes themselves. They become their own little universe. And as they look at life as it develops for them, their whole view is, what is it, in, what is it for me? What's in this for me? Does that sound familiar today? This is what we hear a lot of. But the whole focus has shifted from God to ourselves. And so this, these programs for happiness that the, we develop from early childhood become programs for misery. I remember Father Thomas at uh, one of the many retreats that we had a couple of years ago, and it was during Lent. And as he was sitting there at this huge crowd in the cathedral, he says, you really don't know how sick you are. And they all kind of took back and they said, well, you know, we know this is Lent. But then he proceeds to tell us uh, what the human condition and this homemade self or false self that we have developed with its programs for happiness that can't possibly work create only misery. And so the demand and need for esteem and affection, power and control, for security and survival, uh, are normal things that we develop as a child, these programs. But what happens is, is that those programs don't change and we become adults, we still have these childish programs pushing us around. It's more like the motor or the engine that's really running us and instead of us being in charge. So if we understand when these programs for happiness develop, they develop by maybe seven or eight years old, and a child does not have reason to help modify these demands. The rational consciousness has not kicked in. So actually what the child is developing is these demands uh, for happiness in a direction that can't possibly work with this desire and thirst for happiness, but not with the practical experience of the divine in their lives. And so that void is there, so they have lots of friends, just like the disciples, out on the light, all looking for more security, more esteem and affection, and more parent control, and nobody knows where to find it, but they all are together in their group. And what happens as the, as the child develops too, they begin to over-identify with their own social group, with their culture, and so the influence, and these programs are pretty well solidified, even by the time as the self emerges into self-reflective consciousness. They have not had the personal experience of intimacy with God. So that loss of intimacy with God is the key to understanding of why we're searching everywhere outside of ourselves to know where that happiness lies. And we're looking for it out there. Does that resonate? I mean, I, I, I stand here in the human condition talking about this, and I really realize is that the push and the drive inside of me is all coming from my programs. And why it's so important that you understand what this human condition is doing, and these motors of the security and uh, esteem and affection and power control energy centers are shoving you around, and you're really not in charge of your life. And what growing up means, and we do have to take ourselves in hand and grow up, is that we've got to take these biological needs that are normal and instinctual and relativize them with reason and grow up 
to a point that we take responsibility for our lives and stop blaming other people. The thing to know, too, is that our body is a warehouse of emotions, and everything that's happened to us has been recorded in our, this warehouse of our body and our nervous system. So it's the beginning of the addiction process. When a child begins to face painful situations, what does it do? It stuffs it inside and pushes it into the unconscious so they can relieve and be free of the pain that they're experiencing and which they don't want to face. So we start the process of coping mechanisms to shove everything into the unconscious. And so this is how, over the years, we develop this homemade self. And the drive for happiness is getting stronger and stronger. And society continues to support your drive for security. More, more of everything, uh, more, of, more houses, more cars, uh, more clothes, better jobs, whatever. But we have these programs and recipes for happiness that can't possibly work. And unless we wake up and become aware that it doesn't work, um, you know, we are programmed for misery for all our lives. And as Thomas says, maybe we have to get uh, divorced two or three times, hit in jail maybe four or five times. Um, and maybe by 65 or 70, we say maybe these programs for happiness really don't work. But you know, if you want to take the spiritual journey, it's time to wake up. And these are what the practice that uh, Gail is going to share with you is really very important. Because we have to realize that our emotional programs are going to be challenged in our daily life all the time. There's always going to be somebody in your face, someone who's triggering an annoyance or an upset, and you're going to feel it in your body. And when one of those important programs are challenged, and so you're deprived and you can't have what you want, something you're attached to, or something that you have an aversion for, you're going to feel those afflictive emotions in your body. What naturally come up are grief and anger, discouragement, and then the whole lot of other attitudes come. So what happens is, is when you begin to feel that, that's the red flag to say, I'm stuck in my stuff. I'm stuck in my false self system. Now, we want to become free of this, but we want to know also that God calls us to this freedom and trans uh, transformation. But what you have to know is the false self is not going to drop dead on command. You can change your address and you can change your clothes, but as long as you don't ask the false self, to change because it will adapt itself to its new environment. So you have the struggle that St. Paul knew in the early times when he said in Romans 7, I do what I don't want to do and what I don't want to do, I do. These emotional programs for happiness and the over-identification with our group and our commentar commentaries just reinforce our innate tendencies that have the source in the unconscious. Remember, the child pushes all that stuff down. Emotions are energy. And what happens if these emotions are not processed in our body, they become blocks in our body and our nervous system. And so the spiritual journey is the purification of the unconscious. And it's not the magic carpet of bliss, folks. I must say that we have to be fair. But it's an exercise in letting go of the false self. So what's very important is to know how can we handle these afflictive emotions when our programs are challenged. We do have to let them surface. We have to feel them and let them pass through our, the, our awareness. Otherwise, they get just stuffed right back down into the unconscious. You know, human nature is designed so that our imaginations and our emotions work together, like the wheels of a clock. And so when the emotional programs are challenged, the imagination starts and the feelings come up and what happens is we get the emotional turmoil, the, the emotions fire off, and if we're not careful, we just react instead of, as the adult thing to do, is respond. So Jesus calls us and says, repent, change the direction of what you're looking for happiness. Now, I heard Thomas say this for many, many years. And I realized over the years, even as I taught these, this human condition and watched these tapes, I realized I still had the Gospel of Bernadette, which was <laughs> my programs, because I justify, I glorify, and I rationalize to say, why can't I have this too? I love God. Look at me. I'm, I'm a nun. 
<laughs> you know, it doesn't make any difference. Attitudes have to change, we have to change, and we can't change the unconscious by ourselves. It, it, you know, that's part of the human condition to think we can do it, we don't need God. But we do need grace, and this prayer practice that Gail's going to share is the way we can begin to let go of the false self system, to cooperate with God, and we do have to have God's grace to do this. We cannot do it by ourselves. So the thing that, that for me is that God is our security, that divine love is the full affirmation of who we are. And when we can get in touch with that love, everything works right. When, we're, when we don't have that experience of God and we're not opening ourselves to intimacy with God, nothing really works right. We don't ever have enough of security. We never have enough of esteem and affection. And we never have enough of power and control. And God is calling us to interior freedom, freedom to the children of God. So it means we have to let go of our attachments and our aversions, our shoulds and our emotional programs. The freedom of the children of God means that we can decide what to do about a particular event, okay? Now, there's a whole dynamic of how the human nature and in the human condition works, and that's what this chart is for. First of all, we define the false self system as really the emotional programs for happiness based on values from early childhood. Now notice, unless we change those values and confront them, they, as we as adults, keep these and we have childish behavior. All right, so what happens here in the unconscious, if you notice, are our energy centers. Security and survival, esteem and affection, power and control. And as these energy centers uh, begin to deepen with the programs for happiness, we find that it comes up to the unconscious and as your programs are challenged, this is the dynamic that you experience. Someone, for example, uh, comes into your, your working and uh, they are in your face and they're chewing you out. All right, so what do you do with that? Well, first of all, you have an aversion and you probably want to run, okay? So what happens is it triggers this attachment desire. Remember I said that the child is his own universe where it's just selfish and everything is, what is it in for me? Well, this is an attachment desire that I want it to be a certain way. So the source is selfish. It's not God-centered, it's us. And that collides with the reality of a triggering event in your daily life, person or event. But that person's in your face. And so you do not like confrontation, so what do you feel? Terrible frustration. And then off go the afflictive emotions. And then remember the wheel of the clock, the commentaries begin, and down you go. And this emotional turmoil with the internal dialogue, emotions and thoughts keep feeding you, and the rage begins. And what happens is you shove the painful feelings down into the unconscious and give it more power and just reinforce those programs. Because remember, you believe your program is right. You're going to justify it, you're going to rationalize it, and you're going to glorify it. It's them that made the mistake. You know, how dare they do that to me? Don't they know who I am? And, you know, then the revenge and how you're going to get even. You know, before you, first you were going to tolerate them, but by the time you get through, after your commentaries of a good half hour as you go into the restroom, is you're going to kill them when you walk out. <laughs> so what happens is, and who upset you, really? You upset yourself, exactly. But who do we say? You made me angry, you did it. And so what Thomas is calling us to, when he tells us about this is a process of the false self, we have to take ourselves in hand and take responsibility for our behavior. And that's why this welcoming practice can be so helpful to do that because we step back and there's a little window here where we can decide whether we want our program or not. And this is why this is so important. And this is the window that the prayer practice that Gail's going to talk about is going to fit. But we have a choice and we have to take responsibility and quit blaming others. And as soon as we withdraw that projection, we begin to become free and so do the people around us. And that's what's really wonderful. So, 
You can see the dynamic here, and it can be any triggering event, but realize not only do the three energy centers become involved in our programming, but remember how we over-identify with the group and our cultural conditioning and how we view uh, ourselves as a, a nation or as an American, uh, gender, our prejudices, all those th are all well in place by the time we move into uh, full self con uh, reflective consciousness. And so we have, we do not know how sick we are. And so if you, if you want to get well, you have to begin to be serious about a commitment to the spiritual journey and understand because self-knowledge is so important because we don't know what we're letting go of because the false self is the only thing we've ever known. And uh, we think, is there going to be anything left of me if I let it go? But yes, there is. And God is with us and is calling us to do this. And so, my friends, it's something we all share together is the human condition. But we know we don't want to be programmed for misery any longer. It's not an easy task, but we have to learn to let go. And so this is what Gail is going to share with you, a prayer practice that Mary Mrazowski put together uh, and taught us and have found to be one of the most effective ways to cooperate with God to dismantle these programs for happiness from early childhood. <clears throat> so I think that um, I, I can close by saying, just remember what the Lord said to us, repent, change the direction you're looking for happiness. And just as those disciples realized that the key was in the house, we have to find that key to happiness within ourselves. And we have to get rid of the junk of a lifetime, those emotional blocks and feelings that are preventing that union with God. So, happy letting go. Thank you.